I find interesting that the name of this portion is Lech Lecha, and uh, it, you know, we say, so you will go, and literally the way it would translate is to go for yourself, because the word Lech is from the word Halach. Halach means to walk, or to the, to the way that you go, or, or a wandering, uh, uh, even the, when you talk about Halacha, it's a matter of your, just the your way you do life, you know, just your daily things of life. I find this ironic, because here I sit behind this podium with a sprained ankle, and I ain't moving. <laughs> here this portion is go and walk and i'm like all right here yeah right so so i'm not going to be doing much lech lecha you know <laughs> tonight you know for myself but but i i want to share some things with you in regard to how abraham walked and the things that that he did and the things that the father was trying to reveal in his life and and trying to establish things for us as well, you know, in Genesis 12, 1, now Adonai said to Avram, get yourself out of your country, away from your kinsmen, away from your father's house, and go to the land that I will show you. Lech lecha, he says to go, and notice he doesn't say, go for your family. He doesn't say, go for your descendants. He doesn't say, go for anyone else. He says, go lecha, for you. You know, that's one thing, when it's good that the walk around us, we can have, you know, relationship and community and people around us, and that's, we need that. But when it comes down to, we, we've got to have that personal relationship before we can really have that relationship in a community. Because it's, it's, the, it's the two that really help see us through these things. Without that personal relationship, let's face it, life in a community, it would never happen. <laughs> right? So you've got to have that personal relationship. You've got to have that personal call on what the Father is telling you to do. And what did he tell Avram to do? He said, go away from your country. Out of your co- well, where was he? We'll cover that in a second. And away from your kinsmen. Go away from the place where you're at and go away from the family that you're at. He says to leave your father's house. Why? Because Jeremiah 16, 19, and 20 says this. Lord, my strength and my fortress and my refuge in the day of affliction... The Gentiles shall come to you from the ends of the earth and shall say, what? Surely our fathers have inherited, what? Lies, vanity, and things where there is no profit. Shall a man make gods to himself and they are no gods? Thing is, it says the Gentiles. You know, what is Gentiles? Well, it's the literally definition, the Gentiles means the nations, of all the nations. And so when you talk about Scripture, covenant, you have God made a covenant with Israel, and so we have the covenant there, and then he has all the other nations. And so all the people from all these other nations will say they moved away from the God of Israel. They moved away from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But there's a time coming, and I say is happening, where people are returning to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying he is the one true God. So what did Yahweh tell Avram? What did he say? Well, he tells them to leave the seed of idolatry, to go out from, to go out from there. In verse 2, And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and shall make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless you, and I will curse them that curses you, and in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. The word there is ve'avarcha. Ve'avarcha, it's the word barach, which is for blessing. Like to kneel, to bless, abundant, to praise. But the way this is used here can also be talking about a pool. A pool. And in you shall all the nations of the earth be pulled together. Now look at this. When you think about a pool throughout Scripture, what do you think? Mikvahs. Because what were pools used for? Guys, when you read through Scripture, I don't think they had measurements for an Olympic-sized pool so they could race. All right? The pools were for mikvahs. And, and the mikvah, you know, we call them a baptism today. The pools were for mikvahs, and it would be an immersion to have that change of status, that change of their heart, and it would take someone, it would bring them from a state of unclean to a place of clean where now they can go worship. Can you be mikvahed into a man? Look at this. 1 Corinthians 10. 
Brothers, I don't want you to miss the significance of what happened to our fathers. All of them were guided by the pillar of cloud, and they all passed through the sea. And in connection with the cloud and with the sea, they all immersed themselves into Moshe. Does this mean that they immersed themselves literally into the man, Moses? No. It means what he taught, his example, the life that he gave, what he passed on. So the same would fit in regards to, uh, to Avram, Avraham, right? Galatians 3.8. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen, how? Through faith. Guys, this is where a lot of controversies really start to come in here too, because has God ever done it any other way? No. <laughs> it's always been through faith, Right? He preached the gospel before to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, to be pulled together, to be drawn together. And, and this is where, guys, that teaching comes in. The gospel according to Abraham, this is where that comes in. Because we're teaching about how the people, through what Abraham did, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And it's because of that faith that Abraham had. Look, Galatians 3.29 so also, if you belong to the Messiah, how many of you belong to the Messiah? If you belong to the Messiah, you are what? Seed of Abraham and heirs according to the promise. What promise? The promise that God gave Abraham. It's the Messiah that draws you near to the Father in that same faith that Abraham had. So after Abraham and Lot separated, Yahweh showed him the land. See, he said, go to this land that I will show you, but he didn't show it to him until after the strife stopped. After the contention ceased. And he had that peace. Now, God is revealing the next step. And not just the next step, but all of it. Genesis 13, 14. So Adonai said to Avram, after Lot had moved away from him, look. All around you from where you are, to the north, the south, the east, and the west, all the land you see I will give to you and your descendants forever. Here's your deed title trust. All right? <laughs> Verse 16. And I will make your descendants as numerous as the specks of dust on the earth, so that if a person can count the specks of dust on the earth, your descendants can be counted. 1317. Now. What does it say? Get up and walk? Oh, wait a minute now. Think about this. Literally. What was God telling him to do? I love this. Because here we've got God showing the promise to Avram. He's saying, this is what I'm giving you. This is what I'm giving your descendants. As far as you can see to the north, south, east, and west, look at the promise that I have for you. Look at the great things I have in store for your descendants. And I could see him standing there going, wow. You like that, Avram? Oh, yeah. God, you're so good. Can you believe all these blessings I'm going to give you and, and all your descendants after you? So it's, it's unfathomable, Yahweh. I can't imagine. You really want it? Oh, yeah, Lord, I, I, I really do. Great. So get up and walk it. What? All the land that I showed you, yeah. Do you want it all? Well, yeah. Walk it. What is he telling us? Understand that he went before his descendants and every place where he went, it was established. He walked the borders and the boundaries of the land. That's not like two blocks. <laughs> he walked the boundaries of the land that was there. And what I find in this as well, it's even in the name of this portion, Lech Lecha, to get up and go for yourself. And here he's got this too, the promise that I show you and the things that I give you, do you want that? And I believe all of us can say, yes, we want that. Then God says, great, get up and do it. Get up and walk it. You can't stay where you're at and fulfill what the Father has established for you. You have to get up and walk it. At some point in our life, we're going to have to put one foot in front of the other. And we're going to have to learn to walk in the things that he's established for us. Do we want to go into the promise? Do we want to grow and to mature and to walk in the things and the ways that he established for us? Yes. Then it's up to us to walk with him. 
And Melchizedek, the king of righteousness, the king of Salem, which is Jerusalem, brought forth bread and wine, which is how Yeshua chose to reveal himself. And he was the priest of the Most High God. Go back and read Hebrews 9, 11 and 12. Who does it talk about who is the priest of the Most High God? Melchizedek. Melchizedek is serving, feeding, and teaching. What did Yeshua do? Matthew 4.23. Yeshua went all over, all over the, Galil, the Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing people from every kind of disease and sickness. Matthew 14.19. And he took the five loaves, the two fishes, and looking up to the heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to his disciples, and the disciples to the multitude, and they did all eat and were filled. Luke 12.37. This isn't all, the, all you can find. These are just a few that I've put in here. Happy the slaves whom the master finds alert when he comes. I tell you, he will put on his work clothes, seat them at the table, and come and serve them himself. When Yeshua sat down with his disciples right before he was served up for the crucifixion, what did he do? Girded up his loins and washed their feet. He served them. So he believed in Adonai and he credited it to him as righteousness. He believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. How many of you say, oh, that's in Romans? <laughs> it's right here in, in Genesis. He believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Then he said to him, I am Adonai who brought you out from ur to give you this land as your possession. He replied, Adonai God, how am I to know that I will possess it? So, look at this. The blessings that passed, passed on because Abraham believed. So, what's the testimony of his belief? We covered a little bit on this this past Friday, but what is the testimony of Avram's belief? He believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. So, how do we know that he believed? Is he just said, well, God, I believe that you said, I believe what you said. You're going to do it. But he never left? No. He believed God, so he did what he said. Right? Look at this. Genesis 26, we're jumping ahead real quick. This is the testimony of the blessings going on to the descendants from Abraham because of Abraham. Right? So God says, I'm going to give you all these blessings because Abraham, what? Well, let's look at it. Abraham obeyed my voice. The word is Shema. Oh, to, the word Shema doesn't just mean obey, it doesn't just mean hear, it means hear, receive with the intent of doing what you hear. So Shema, Abraham obeyed my voice. He heard my voice and acted on it, right? And he kept my charge, Mish Mishmerotai, he kept my charge. That's the word Shamar. Shamar is where we get the word Shomer, it means a watchman. It means to keep, to guard, to protect. So he was protecting what God told him to do. Because let's face it, when you're reading the Word and God is telling you to do things, it doesn't look like what everybody else is doing. Everybody else is trying to say, you, you definitely heard wrong. Right? And my, what's that word? Commandments. Mitzvotai. Where we get the word mitzvot? Mitzvah? Abraham kept the commandments that God gave him. What else? My statutes. Hukotai. Statutes. This is also translated as decrees, ordinances, customs. You know, God has customs. They're called hok in the scripture. These are some things that God tells us to do, and he doesn't always tell us why. And we can spend a lot of time just talking about, well, let's see, God told us to do this, and he never really exactly told us why, so let's try to figure out why God told us to do this, and we'll spend all of our time midrashing and midrashing and arguing and yelling and complaining and not doing anything. And we're not doing what he told us to do because we're too busy arguing about it. Think about it. The hukotai. Sometimes God tells us to do things just because he knows better and he just wants us to listen to him. Guys, I guarantee you, you as parents have done the exact same thing to your children. When you tell your kid, don't go run off in the middle of the road. 
Why? As they're standing in the middle of the road. Sometimes you may not have a time for a why. You know? I like to use this example too. How many of you were in the military? You're in a foxhole. You stand up. Your instructor yells, duck. What do you do? Why? <laughs> I guarantee you're dead. <laughs> Sometimes God told us to do something just because he wants us to do it. It's not a matter of trying to say, oh, let's see if we can make him do this. That would be so funny. No. He knows better. And the things that he tells us, it's, it's out, part of his character, part of his life, revealing himself to his people. Remember, when you speak, it says that when you speak, it's out of the overflow of your heart. So when God speaks, it's out of the overflow of his heart. And when he spoke, what did he speak? Starting from the mountain, I am the Lord your God that delivered you out of the hands of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. When he spoke, he revealed what we call commandments. And they are. But does that give it any less credence? Should we not listen to them anyway? These are the things that we don't understand. But we just do because he's God. What's the next one? He obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my Torah. Hey, you want to know what the Hebrew word there is? Torah. <laughs> God instructed Avraham, and he listened. And the, the neat thing about this is that every single one of these is a testimony of how he believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. We miss that part, don't we? So Avraham did what Yahweh told him to do. My question is, was this legalism or obedience? Because today we're taught, if you do what God said to do, well, then you're just being legalistic. Guys, seriously, at what point, when God said to do something, does it become legalistic? You want, you want the honest answer? The minute we decide we don't want to do it? The minute we don't have the heart to listen to him? You can do anything, the right thing, the wrong way. Either your heart is to do or your heart isn't to do. If your heart is not to do and you're forced to do it, is your heart in it? What kind of relationship is that? But if your heart is to be there and to be with him and to walk with him and to do the things that he said to do, that's great. But then as well, are we going to try to yell and scream and be mad at somebody else because they're not doing the same things we're doing? No. Because that's not right either. You know, like we say, you got to understand, we're all in different places with our walk. We're all, we're, some of us are older than others. Some of us are younger than others. Some of us are still learning to walk. Some of us haven't even crawled yet. Are we going to get mad at each other because we don't know everything that we know? How many of you have been doing this for 20 years or more? How many of us did, have been doing this for two minutes? <laughs> Can we get mad at one for, because they're not where we are here? And the answer is no. We should be learning to walk together and cultivating each other and walking with that same unity of heart and the mind and purpose towards the same goal. And if we do it that way, it doesn't matter at what point we are in our walk, as long as we're walking together. Well, if this teaching has blessed you, I want you to check out our other resources. You can check out our website at www.ruachonline.com. And there's links there to other resources that are available to you, other teachings, other books, other offerings. Uh, you can go to YouTube, Facebook, all of these things from our website. And uh, check us out, because if they enjoyed this teaching, there's going to be much more that hopefully will bless you as well. Thank you. Hi, this is Dr. David Jones from Ruach Ministries International, and I've got some exciting news for you. We have a new series coming out, six-part series of the Gospel According to Abraham. Abraham? 
What does he got to do with the gospel? Well, you're going to have to find out, aren't you? The thing is, Galatians 3 says that the gospel was proclaimed to Abraham. So what does that mean for a believer today? What does that mean to a person who is not Jewish? What does that mean to a person who is Jewish? What does that mean for all of us today? Well, check it out. It's a good series and it'll be coming your way soon. For more information, you can check out our website at www.ruachonline.com. Hi, this is Dr. David Jones here. I just want to say we do have some other resources available to you, one of which is a book entitled Famine, Walking and Blessing in the Time of Famine. It's based out of Amos 8, 11, and 12, talking about there's a famine of hearing the word of the Lord. So what is that famine? Does it mean the word of the Lord is not being proclaimed, or does it mean there's a famine of actually listening to it? Hmm. Food for thought, isn't it? Well, if you want to know more, check it out. Go to www.ruachonline.com. There's a link on our homepage. Just click and it'll take you to more information on the book entitled Famine, Walking in Blessing in a Time of Famine. Well, how important are the feasts of the Lord? I think we can say that if the Lord set out a banquet, set out a table and invited you to come be a partaker, would we answer? Would we hear? Would we go? Or would we blow them off because we have something more important to do? Well, that's what this book is. The king invites you to his table. Are we going to answer the call? The feast of the Lord, appointed times where the Lord has said he wants to meet with us face to face. Will we heed? Will we answer? Will we go? Check it out, www.ruachonline.com. On the homepage, there is a link to take you for more information. The King invites you to his table.